they have to miss more days because they're not feeling well and they don't even want to talk about you know how food insecurity is plaguing them right and so then we go up and their household income is going down because they're spending so much time with the doctors or trying to manage how they feel and less time working making less money right and their spending trade-offs are going up. So they're spending more money trying to figure out what's wrong, going to go see doctors, maybe trying to at least buy the right foods that they can um, eat to manage those, those diseases. And we get right back to food insecurity. So this is a cycle. We see the cycle everywhere, the cycle of poverty, right? It mimics the cycle of poverty. And so Food America studies this a lot. They look at, you know, how food insecurity impacts several domains of our lives. And so why am I showing you all of this? I'm showing you all of this to say food insecurity relates to all of us. You know, some of you guys come from the lens of parents, right? And so you might have personal experiences with this or know other parents or know parents that might say, my child have behavioral problems. Do your child have behavioral problems or is it a health thing, right? And we don't want to talk about those things. Those things aren't conversation starters, right? Some of you guys come from it of the lens of teachers and you're seeing children come in maybe less fortunate than your other students and that impact how they want to, you know, behave or how they want to um, interact with those other children, right? And so 69% of the people who took the Feed in America survey said they had to choose between food and utilities, right? So they had to choose between going to go get the foods they need or paying water and heat and gas and those necessary things. 67% say they had to choose between food and transportation. But oh my goodness, it's not that easy for people because what if you need food and transportation? <laughs> what if you don't have a car or a bus pass, but you need those things to go access the supermarket that's five miles away, or that's even a mile away, right? 66% they said they had to choose between food and medical expenses. Again, not easy for everyone. You need to go see the doctors if you have something like diabetes for insulin management, right? Weight management, sugar management. You need those glucose strips. You need the glucose monitoring system. All of these things that cost money, but you still need the food to be able to manage the disease. So it's this constant cycle of having to choose between those. Do you think your health is going to improve? Then 57% said they had to choose between food and housing, 31% food and education, 79% said they purchased inexpensive and unhealthy foods. So in my household, we were around, I would say that medium to low food insecurity. So I never went to bed hungry. However, I didn't have access to fresh produce. We didn't have the apples and the oranges and the kale and things like that. Those were commodities. We had those things on Thanksgiving and Christmas and birthdays, right? What we were eating was canned goods. What we were eating was the bagged rice with all the flavors in it, the, the ready-made meals, the frozen packs, things that was a dollar, things that were 10 for 10, right? We want to look at those things um, and say, okay, those are things that we can afford in our budget. We're going to get those. And for snack time, it was the Debbie cakes for a dollar. Those things that could keep us full, but maybe wasn't the healthiest for us, right? So we keep looking at these statistics and we say, okay, there's this ugly cycle that's happening that I showed you and people are often having to choose. So, you know, food insecurity is prevalent, right? But let's look at this from a racial lens because the food system wasn't built on such a just background, right? So we all know, I hope at least we all know, slavery happened. Okay, it happened. Then what? Then we had this large migration from the south to the north. People was coming to the north for better jobs. They was coming in hopes of not having so much racism. They were coming for housing, right? They wanted better lives for their family. So they said, okay, we're gonna go to the north to go and find this. So then they said, okay, we're finding our houses. Houses, then what? Then you had states or neighborhoods that say, okay, we don't want to be integrated. So states said, okay, we'll allow, you know, black people, we'll allow the former indentured servants, we'll allow people who were formerly enslaved to come here, but we have to do something about not wanting neighborhoods to be integrated. So they build black housing projects, right? And so what they did was they built these pro projects, um, as they're formerly called, where they were cramped, um, there was a lot of them, they're high rise, and they're the slums of the city. The city. They were built by uh, maybe manufacturing plants. They were built um, all the way out on the outskirts of the city. They were built the places where housing wasn't, you know, something that people wanted to have there. 
and there was this stigma against agriculture. So people said, we just got off the cotton fields, we just got off the, you know, farmers agricultural field, we just got out of, out of working all of these fields, we don't want to do any agriculture, I don't want to be working any fields, right? It was a stigma against that. It was seen as you're still less than, you're still lower, right? Because at that time, there weren't white people in the fields, right? They were in the nice jobs, they were doctors, they were lawyers, they were able to go to college and be afforded these resources that the formerly enslaved were not. And then those who wanted to do agriculture said, okay, great, we're gonna go and we're gonna get some land and we're gonna start our own farms. Well, then there was laws against that, right? So then there was this, well, you can't have your own farm. You have to work for somebody. And by the time they charged you for the land that you had, the tools that you had, the seeds that you needed, you were already in debt to them. So here we are at slavery again. And then uh, food is a sign of wealth. So food, to be able to go out and purchase your own food and to make your own meals was seen as a sign of wealth, a sign as you made it. You had the money, you could do that. Or to even be able to shop at supermarkets, right? And so here we go again with what I mentioned before, supermarkets are businesses. Supermarkets need to make money. That's how they thrive. A supermarket cannot just give their food away, right? So we think about all these things and we say, okay, what's happening in our food environment? What can we do to address this? And we get these programs that are there to help combat this food insecurity. And here's where food gardens come in. So I wasn't introduced to food gardens in the schoolings. I was actually introduced to it in an urban, uh, urban gardening lens. Um, and in one of the historically black neighborhoods I studied, which was Cherry Hill in Baltimore City, they actually started urban gardens. So the whole community took turns going to water the gardens, going to prune it, going to plant. And they actually used the uh, vegetables that was, that was grown there to donate to schools, to donate to the community, and to make community meals out of it. And that was in conjunction with some of these other programs that I have um, listed down here, such as the free food program, um, and such as free food trucks. So during the summer, there's higher rates of food insecurity because there's a population of kids who rely on the meals in school to be fed every day. And so then during the summer, it can be a daunting time for parents of how am I going to be able to afford this food, right? How am I going to be able to feed my kids? And so to combat that in Baltimore, and I'm not quite sure if it's anywhere else, um, they have a free food truck that comes out twice a day in the summer and give the kids bag breakfast and bag lunch. And that's amazing for that community. They absolutely loved it. And so I talked about um, some of the people who are migrating north who wanted to have land, who wanted to farm, who wanted to do agriculture. And this is when a full sovereignty piece come in, right? And so in 1823, the Supreme Court actually ruled that um, there was a right of discovery, right, for Native uh, Americans. So they couldn't have their land. There was a right of occupancy, the right of discovery. We have the land. You have to pay for the land. You can't have the land that you were already on. You need to move, right? Latino families, right? They lost their land in the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe, right? And so they said that they had the, the Americans wanted to take back their land. It's no longer your land, it's our land. We want it in this treaty. You can't have this land anymore. Black farmers faced dispossession. So some um, farmers who were black at the time during slavery, because there was some black uh, farmers and plantation owners during slavery, um, they had their land so that when they uh, passed away, their land could be divided up among their heirs. Well, during that time, it was a bunch of heirs. So the division of the land became smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it was none. And those who did have enough land to possess, it became dispossessed, right, um, during Andrew Johnson's term. And so bringing it back to food insecurity and food gardens, um, the story of Jane, right? So Jane's my grandma, and I just use her name to, to for a synonym for all people that are facing similar situations, right? Zip codes with higher percentage of black people have half as many supermarkets as compared to zip codes with predominantly white neighborhoods. Zip codes with predominantly black people have 25% fewer supermarkets and uh, 1.3 times as many convenience stores as compared to other uh, races. And other studies have found as many as four times supermarkets in white communities as black ones. And these are all studies that have been coming out in the early 2000s, 2003, 2006, 2007. 
um, not too far from today. And this is all this is all of my thesis, so I didn't have the time to go look up the studies that are actually coming out now. And this is just you know compared to it's just speaking to the food environment. This food environment is one that is persistent. And like I said, it impacts your health, it impacts your wealth, it impacts a lot of things. And so when we think about school gardens and where they come in, right? The story of Jane. Jane was involved in a school garden around the corner. She has my little cousin who she adopted, and so now she's really involved in the school. Well, how do they use their school gardens? One, as this food piece. So what's grown in the garden, they actually use for snack time. So they grow things like carrots and apples. They cut the apples up, they cut the carrots up, they, you know, I, I don't know what else they um, grow there. But they actually use those things to give to the kids and say, here. And during the after school program that my little cousin is in, they actually go out and they play in the garden. So they say, okay, this is how you, you know, check the soil, this is how you weed, this is how you do these things. Furthermore, it's used as a behavioral tool. So instead of Baltimore City was trying a lot of things to do instead of detention, they was trying a lot of remedial programs. What can we do for kids who are not performing as well, not behaving as well, instead of punishment, instead of detention? And so what they did was things like meditation and things like school gardens. You go out, you garden, right? You go out, you sit in a garden. You go out, you read in a garden. You go out and that garden is part of your environment. So, I believe this is to sum it up. Um, to sum it up, not to beat you over the head, <laughs> food insecurity is prevalent and race matters a lot because food insecurity affects everybody, but it disproportionately affects people of color, people of a lower income, wealth matters, okay? And so this map is showing a lack of healthy foods, um, where there's a lack of healthy foods and people of color, okay? So the blue is areas where there's a lack of healthy food, and this grayish, grainy area is tracks of people of color. And so you see, okay, the blue isn't everywhere where there's large people of color, so that's that piece where food insecurity impacts everyone, but there's a lot of blue where there are tracks of gray, right? And so, what I do. <laughs> oh, okay. I added a nice <laughs> transition. Um, there are impacts, okay? Um, so I, I, I'm a teaching assistant at the university, and so we taught some of this data actually this week about food insecurity to wrap up and about health. It was health psychology week, right? And so food insecurity impacts what you'll eat, because of that, that uh, income piece, it impacts health. So more kids are obese. When we think about obese, we're thinking, oh, kids are eating so much sugar, kids are eating so much. But actually, obesity grows out of food insecurity because you can't access the foods that you need to be healthy, right? So you are gaining more weight because you're consuming more sugar and salt. <coughs> and at this food insecurity piece, the food system is really this integrated piece. I really like this graph in the top left. It's this integrated piece of labor, affordability, distribution. So we could talk about this all day, right? I could have went into the labor piece and how when we think about food insecurity, we also want to think about how farmers are disproportionately affected. There's a lot of farmers who are low income. There's a lot of farmers who don't have access to healthy fruits, foods, and vegetables themselves, right? There's a lot of small farmers who are being pushed out because of big farmers in these manufacturing, co manufacturing companies. And there's a lot of bills that I've heard, I'm not a farmer myself, has been disproportionately affecting small farmers, right? We could talk about the production, making sure that people in restaurant kitchens, so the servers, the line cooks, the dishwashers, making sure that they're food insecure, making sure our waiters aren't making, you know, below the poverty line, and making sure that the people in the food production uh, system, such as people that transport food, are food, uh, food aware, food uh, secure as well. We could talk about distribution. Where is the food being distributed to? Where are our farmer's market located at? Where is the densest part of the population? Who are we reaching? Who are we impacting? And then what we're really focusing on today is access in schools. So we could talk about this all day, but I talked about a very small piece, but we want to continue and to be aware and to have these conversations, and that's why I'm glad we're having this today. So I believe that's the, uh, this is just no, talked about all of that. Cool. That's you. So I'm gonna turn it over. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So just kind of.
of picking up, we talked about some really broad scale, what is our food system um, in relation to race and class and just bringing it home to really understand um, that we are talking about kids here too. We're not just talking about adults and choices that adults make and that when we're working with school gardens, we're thinking about uh, kids and the impact that the food system has on those kids and the outside and then what we can do in our school gardens. So looking at the fact that one in two children of color are on track for diabetes and that 45% of obese or overweight children are poor. And so just understanding that those are diet related uh, diseases and that also that uh, in, within those two is a concept of stress and how stress levels impact your health. And if you have increased stress because you have uh, an increased burden or barriers to achieving or uh, receiving healthy foods, then uh, that's gonna impact, you know, it's gonna be a cyclical impact of stress as well. But we have school gardens as opportunities to grow healthy food and to provide opportunities to connect with, with culture and offer a place to de-stress. So looking at our community school district um, and just bringing it home to like uh, a few of us here who are working within this district and looking at what our landscape looks like for race and class and social equity. And I don't know if any of you saw that recently, uh, Little Village put out an article that uh, the school is redefining the, the boundaries for elementary schools, the district is on a district level. And there were some quotes here that I wanted to pull out of understanding that after years and years of discussing it, we remain woefully segregated by income levels and race in many of our schools. So that was a reason why the, the school board moved to change those district boundaries, understanding that this is here, this isn't just at, you know us as a country or like anything, and that this is happening in our community and that we need to address it. And then also the board president actually said that it's not, it's gonna be our entire community that needs to rally around the school to have every one of our students have an equitable experience in the classroom. So understanding it's not just these higher level decisions, it's not just the school board's job to make sure that this is happening and that we're addressing this, it's everyone and individuals in our community, it's, uh, it's more than just teachers and staff, it's everyone. And this is a highlighted section of free and reduced lunch numbers in various schools and I just highlighted ones that were above 50% and then and or below 20% and just looking at some of the the distribution there you can just see that this is some of the you know this is what uh, people are looking at when they're saying that there are these inequities in distribution cool. uh, so yeah we're talking about equality equity and justice we have these systems that are operating in ways that were built on some of these inequitable systems, but how do we so how do we move forward from here? And how many of you have you have how many of you out there have seen a picture like the one like one of these out there? Awesome. Cool. Has anyone seen a picture like the one uh, like this one? Has anyone seen that picture? It's on the fence too. Ooh, there's like a chain link too. Can you see through the Odia box? Yeah, yeah. So there's uh, many iterations of this, and I like looking at these two pictures, um, the one, so talking about equality versus equity. So with the understanding that equality is you give everyone the same thing, you know, you give everyone the same textbook, and then uh, with the expectation that everyone will have the same experience with that and the same results. And if you think about beyond the fence, maybe that is our uh, success in school instead of a baseball game or you know the road, we're thinking uh, in that perspective for school gardens. And equity is the understanding that uh, people have different needs and uh, need, di and therefore need different, um, uh, need different assists and assets in order to achieve the same outcomes. What I like about the picture about this one, a, um, so all the kids are the same height, they're kids too, we're talking about school gardens, and they're all the same height. Um, something that was pointed out in an article, uh, somebody was writing about this and saying, I'm tired of seeing this picture because it makes it seem like the, the person that's on, the, the shortest person is inherently, um, that they're inherently deficit, that there's something inherently uh, the matter with them of why they can't uh, achieve the same goal. And this. In this picture, you see that everyone is the same height, and it's really just about the fence, and also about the ground here is really making the difference. And so understanding that, you know, you have to give, um, in order to achieve the same outcome, you have to give different things, but then also looking at why is the ground different? Like, what can we do about that? 
And so I think that that's where we get into thinking about justice. You know, equity is like, okay, everyone can see over the fence. But to me, justice is understanding that what we need to do and what we can do with school gardens is not only get everyone to be seeing over the fence, but also give everyone shovels and start re-leveling that and give everyone, you know, hand tools and start taking down that fence. So before we just start handing out some shovels, uh, <laughs> you know, something we need to do a lot is think about um, our, our own understanding. So doing self work before we're doing garden work, especially if we want to do it equitably and with a lens, uh, with an equity lens. So understanding that we want to commit to deepening our, uh, our understanding of the connection between race, socioeconomic status, and health outcomes. To do that, we need to listen to others, especially those that are experiencing the world different, differently, be comfortable with discomfort. So if you're not used to, if you have limited understanding of a topic, and whether it's race or something else, that can be uncomfortable. Confusion is uncomfortable, and being understanding that you might uh, be listening to a story and uh, have a different experience and that that might cause some discomfort, but being able to accept that and still be open and listening uh, while you're working through that. And also seeking out opportunities to learn more, whether it's through articles you're reading, events you're going to, showing up to this school garden conference, um, community orgs or groups that you might join, uh, but understanding that it's not always, it's not just a checklist of like, okay, I can do, you know, I'm gonna do this school, school garden workshop, and then I'm gonna read this article, and then I'm gonna do this, and once I've checked all those things off that I have a complete understanding of social equity and how to practice it, that it's an, uh, a lifelong thing, and that you're gonna to continue to reevaluate it. And so we wanna have that understanding of our self-work, and we're gonna let this guide our work in school gardens. So thinking about um, how do we grow our school garden with an equity lens. And I have a worksheet that uh, everyone, as we're following through these questions, can uh, feel free to jot some notes down. And I have some pens in the folder if anyone needs one. Cool, so the first question, you know, we're talking about how, so how do we incorporate this into our school garden structure? Um, the biggest thing is, uh, also I just wanna give a shout out to Janetta Hargrove who created this graphic here of uh, visuals for thinking about your equity lens. Like you can think about, you know, did I put on my equity lens today? <laughs> and or did I leave it at home? So thinking about how we wanna listen to everyone who is or could be connected to the garden community, not just who slash when it is easy. So we definitely want to celebrate our champions and the first people you know, who raise their hand and say, I volunteer to be a part of this garden. But understanding uh, that, that may, um, we may not be hearing all the people who could be champions and that we need to allow that space. And maybe it might take a little bit more energy on our side to reach out and really make those connections, but that can provide a really valuable resource. Uh, we want to involve others and ask for help and we want to evaluate all aspects of the garden, mission, partners, and communication uh, on a regular basis. So understanding that we're gonna make mistakes and we're gonna try to show up the best we can and that we're gonna be okay um, and what we can do is reflect on those mistakes and decide how we wanna do something better. So just like we might uh, for a school garden try decide we wanna try a new variety of carrots next year, maybe we decide a new way to host meetings or a new, um, you know, a new organization to reach out to. All right, so one of the first questions when you're thinking about garden planning, so uh, yeah, it's the worksheet I think is called Before We Plant, We Plan, and I think that's super important when you wanna show up with an equitable lens. And so looking at what are the garden's goals. So as we go through these questions today, just remembering that you know, you might show up here, you might be the only person from your garden or um, your future garden represented here, and that's okay. It's okay to think about these things and brainstorm these ideas, and really just this is a framework for uh, you to bring back to your school garden and uh, answer those questions all together, because we're not making decisions here today, we're just sharing ideas. So what are the garden's goals? They could be about education, and this is gonna impact the space of the garden, you know, how much space are you allotting to education, um, community engagement, you want to have the space for people to actually sit and share, um, so that would impact uh, that, having uh, space for therapy and production. So understanding that how you uh, prioritize your goals is going to impact what your garden space looks like and how 
you uh, are able to do programming in this space. So this is actually a picture of Molly in an online school garden. So uh, recognizing that they wanted a space for, pe uh, for kids to be able to come out and sit and have lessons, they uh, set aside this portion of the garden that wasn't gonna be just in production, it was gonna be that space uh, for gathering. So recognizing that with their goals, that was uh, important to the garden and to the school and they wanted to create that space for that. Which school was that? Um, it's in Old Wine. It's in Northeast Iowa. Okay. Yeah, Northeast Iowa. All right, so how do you decide what grows in the garden? So using your goals. So that's the first thing you can look at. Your goals help you decide uh, what decisions to make. And uh, so this could be also influenced by what do people in your school community eat? Understanding, as we've heard a few times, you know, you're not just going to um, move someone a mile or get someone to just try a vegetable maybe that they've never tried before uh, offhand, but understanding that you want to meet people where they're at. Uh, so one example for myself working at North Liberty Community Pantry, we did a taste and tour at the end of the year and we would put our vegetables from the garden on pizza that we would make. So understanding that that's something that people in our community like to eat, a uh, bunch of people like pizza. They might not have had butternut squash or beets on a pizza, but uh, they were more willing. It was a more accessible thing to try because they uh, were familiar with pizza. So here, um, this is, or are there any culturally relevant foods that the garden can grow? So this is an example of a school garden in Hawaii that actually grew uh, some native foods and uh, breadfruit or ulu that they were able to provide in their school lunch. So that was something that was culturally relevant to the students and that they could incorporate into their garden. All right, what partners do you work with? So understanding that there's many different types of partners. So there's individuals, there's institutions, there's community and school groups, and there's also local businesses and nonprofits. So institutions could be um, you know, your local government, it could be extension, your individuals are your parents or your teachers, your school groups are the PTO, local businesses could be your local grocery stores like hy V or other nonprofits like Field of Family. So who are all the people that you're working with and how can you um, extend the hand wider? You know, what can you do for next year or uh, who maybe should you ask uh, who maybe in your network that is already at the table has new partners that you could bring on board? And so on the back of the worksheet, uh, if you guys will look, there's actually an asset map that would be uh, beneficial potentially of a resource to bring back to your school garden and be able to do as a community. And on the asset map, it talks about reciprocal relationships. So understanding that people may be giving things to your school garden, but what are also they receiving? Because why do people keep showing up? It's because they're getting something out of the garden. It's because they're enjoying benefits of having that community asset, having that space for, their, uh, for the kids to go and grow, and uh, just being really uh, candid about that. And maybe if you don't know what they're getting out of the garden, asking them. And just having that kind of conversation and understanding that, that that's gonna build those sustainable relationships. And when we're talking about asset mapping, we're looking at our assets or strengths, so listing our skills, our resources, um, could be community knowledge, so people who've been in the community a long time have seen it go through a lot of changes, pure infrastructure, so there's a fence there, this person has a place where we could wash the vegetables, uh, ecology, so what are the, um, what are the plants themselves bringing to the table? Uh, the marketing, you know, somebody might not have any skills or interest in gardening, but could potentially be a great marketing force or mobilize people to come to the garden, somebody who's great at getting volunteers to show up, um, or somebody who, an institution that might amplify the gifts and talents. So when people work together, we're able to amplify those of an individual. So understanding that um, and listing those assets first and uh, asking, because if we have, so the school garden is in the center, and then you have all those community assets that are able to help strengthen it, and recognizing that if one side is lagging a little bit, then that's gonna be a little bit unstable in that web with that community assets. All right, how do you communicate with others about your garden? So what languages are native to those in your school community? What forms of communication do you do those in your school garden group prefer? So this is an example of the National Farm to School Network has many uh, garden resources, school garden resources in Spanish, primarily in Spanish, but recognizing that, you know, 
also maybe barriers to who you're bringing to the table and who's showing up and who's able to show up. If you're only communicating via Facebook about your garden, people who use Facebook are the only people who are gonna respond. <laughs> and, and so understanding that that might um, take a little, uh, you know, figuring out at first and trying different methods. So maybe it's through email, maybe it's through sending flyers home with kids, maybe it's through text message, maybe it's a little bit of everything because you're trying to reach that diverse and also then what does your garden messaging focus on? So if it's only hitting, maybe it's your favorite thing about the school garden, but if it's not everyone's favorite thing about the school garden, like they're not excited about beets and you just keep talking about beets and they're like, nah, that's just not my thing. Or you know, you don't show other things or other opportunities or have a diverse representation that matches what your school environment is, then people are not gonna feel heard, they're not gonna feel seen and they're not gonna show up. And uh, last but not least, are you encouraging local voices to lead? So understanding, you know, with uh, our group agreements today, recognizing that that can be in place and something you can think about all the time. If you're the person who's always stepping up, um, what would it look like if you took a step back? And how, and I think that we've heard that a few times here, and I think people are, you know, recognizing that and understanding that when you are able to step back, then other people can step up. And if people feel valued and understand that their strengths are valuable, you know, on that asset map where we need those strengths, then people will show up. And uh, allowing those people to lead with their strengths. And also, like we had mentioned earlier today, having kids involved. So what does it look like when youth lead? When youth take the reins, and it doesn't have to be an adult who has all the best ideas. I think kids are a uh, great idea generators. All right, and I'm hoping that this video will work. All right, I need a technical stand by phone. <laughs> this is from um, Appetite for Change, writing can cost you. an organization in uh, Minnesota. taking the lead and the ownership like these kids are loving it like this is full of so much energy and joy that um, gives me energy and joy in this work and I think that 
is something that when we let other people lead and you know can take a step back, then we're able to uh, enable these kinds of things to grow. Cool. And I think that is the end of our presentation. If there are any questions or anything, happy to answer. Um, just encourage you to take that worksheet with those questions back.